welcome. Once again, you are listening to the voice of Free Arcadia, the world's only Liege Matsumoto-focused podcast. So happy to have you all back. It has been a hot minute since we've been able to have one of these. And that's in part because we've been waiting on a very, very special guest. We'll get to him in just a moment. Firstly, I'm Captain Hardluck. I own the Liegeverse uh, page, facebook.com slash Liegeverse. And I am joined once again by my trusty companion, Chad. Chad, how are you doing today? Trusty. <laughs> trust. I trust you. How about you? I trust you a good bit. I trust you enough to have you on this podcast. I'll, I'll say that. Again, I'm doing... Absolutely fantastic. We have Darren John Ashmore, uh, initiator, editor of the world's, really, I think might be the first uh, biographical account of Liege Matsumoto in a very trustworthy academic form. Darren, how are you doing today? Oh, not bad, thank you, Jacob. Excellent. And uh, we had you on before. It was wonderful to talk to you about your book, Leiji Matsumoto, Essays on the Manga and Anime Legend. And we couldn't ask for a better uh, guest to help us go through today's topic. And today we're going to be talking about the life and times of Leiji Matsumoto. A few things before we get started here. While I do heartily believe that this is going to be the most comprehensive uh, video, in English at least, on Leiji Matsumoto's entire life, uh, his, his, the story of events beat by beat, this is in no way definitive. Firstly, the man is still with us and hopefully will be for quite some time. Uh, secondly, Darren uh, has informed me that uh, there's, I don't hope I'm not spoiling too much here. Stop me if I am, Darren, but uh, no, there may be- Be careful what you say. There may be more. There may be more to learn in the future. And and Darren may help us learn those things in the future. Is that, is that okay to say? I'm certainly working towards that. And just, uh, and just as with the first book, if another book is in the works, it is not going to be a monolith. The reason why, if the first book is enjoyable at all, it is because it is collaborative. We were very Absolutely. fortunate to draw in and entice our partners, Tim Eldred, Stephanie, Helen, the whole, the whole lot make the book work. I think you know, I could not have done it on my own. Absolutely. And, and we've been so lucky at Liegeverse to have Helen, Tim, uh, Jonathan Tarbox, who have all contributed on uh, the podcast. So, it's been such a pleasure to speak with all of you, and it's exciting to know that there's more to know. But I'm very confident that today we're going to be giving you a very solid uh, walkthrough of what's happened. But we're going to have to go quick. There's a lot to go over and not all the time in the world to do it. But like Darren said, uh, his book, please go check it out. We're going to start a little bit before M Matsumoto's birth. And in 1919, which we learned when... Uh, Eti uh, sorry, Watcha joined us on Liegeverse. The French military trained Matsumoto's father how to pilot fighter jets. And this was something that was very, that ended up resonating a lot through the rest of Matsumoto's life, the events that occurred uh, to Matsumoto's father and what he learned by being under his father and what he learned from his father. He was born as Akira Matsumoto, and that was in uh, 1938, uh, January 2nd. That's his birthday. September 27th in 1940, Japan entered World War II, and Matsumoto's father fought that war, and he was uh, higher up. He was commanding uh, pilots. If I can jump in point. here. Sure. Point. Yes, please. First of all, a little bit of a personal point. I'm sure you heard from Etienne about the, the secret book which he and his wife and his friends researched for Matsumoto Sensei. Yes, we, we've got a full interview with him on the on the page. I saw that book at the Jisha. I was not even allowed to touch it. So closely <laughs> do the con are the contents protected. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how well regarded the Sensei is in France. 
and how popular Albator is, that the Ministry of Defense there were willing to open their files to Etienne and allow him to go through their records of the 1919 Japanese military survey. I was not aware it was a privilege. I, I thought maybe it was public, you know, uh, record. There are public records and there are public records, but it took quite a lot, I think, to get that material together and then to lock it up for the sensei because some things are not for public consumption, even though that galled me. But I understand Etienne's reasons. And again, yes. to World War II, Tsuyoshi started working, as it were, with the Japanese Naval and Army Air Corps well before World War II. Not even before the, the Chinese invasion, as a trainer of both interceptors and fighters. And by the time the war came up, I think he was already getting a little disillusioned with the way the war was being prosecuted. Mm -hmm. but kept going right to the end. Even by the end, training the so-called special purpose pilots and leading the last great charge at Operation Tengo. And as Matsumoto told us for the book, his father was directly above the Yamato when it exploded. Wow. 30,000 feet up and still felt the explosion. That must have resonated with him, especially coming home on that day and having to face wives and daughters and sons saying, where are our family members and not knowing how to speak to them, hanging up his flight helmet for the last time, going home to his son who had been, as it were, scattered all around Kyushu moving time and time and time again and watching places that he loved burn. Now, these sort of things leave scars, especially on children and especially on parents. It's a, a very difficult time for the entire Matsumoto family, but the, in, the entirety of Japan as well. And uh, Matsumoto's father making very difficult moves uh, following very difficult orders as many Japanese soldiers were as many soldiers in general general yeah. not a good time for a verbal slip up but uh yes and that and that was in 1945 uh September 2nd when uh Japan surrendered uh, to World War II the Yamato uh, being sunk very very shortly before that during World War II uh, Matsumo Matsumoto, Akira Matsumoto at that point, was was growing into his own as well. Uh, he was developing uh, his artistic taste at that point. And in 1943, he sees The Spider and the Tulip in theaters and serendipitously, fatefully, perhaps destined, ends up seeing it at the same theater, at the same screening, at the same time as Asamu Tezuka. This, this having a very important impact on him, as we'll see later in his, his later works. And, you know, I'm not really sure if they, they, they obviously didn't interact much. They didn't recognize each other, but it was very serendipitous that they saw it. So as this war was raging outside, the, the children in, in Japan were, were seeking refuge in movie theaters and being entertained and developing their taste, as I said. Both of them would in later years, look at that particular meeting as, you know, a touch of fate. Mm -hmm. But they also commented on the, the nature of such films. I suppose every side deals in propaganda, but things like Momotaro Sea Eagles, the, the 1941 bombing of Popeye and his mates by a bunch of animals, and other films that go with it, demonstrated that Japan was looking to, I don't know, weaponize youth for the long haul. And that's the way Matsumoto put it, that these sort of easily absorbed forms of media were the average, you know, the sort of recruiting ground for the, the war as they saw it. But it was nice, as he said, to see that in the, the midst of all of this, there was still a refuge for youth in other things. And whilst The Spider and the Tulip has not aged well as a film, 
the fact that it did draw these two people together into, as you say, an almost serendipitous moment of post hoc unification, yeah, it's become part of the mythology of the Lady Bird. Matsumoto's father returns uh, after the war ends for the Japanese, and he declines further piloting work, uh, whether it be commercial or military, uh, and, and he switches professions, and this causes his family's class to drop considerably uh, within Japan. And after this time, of course, the United States occupation of Japan begins, and we will see that this as well has a very dramatic impact on Matsumoto and his work as we see those themes repeated again and again you can see our uh, in-depth review of uh, the Galaxy Express movie and we end up coming upon this time and time again we'll see this more in the future in in 1947 though from his website's records indicate he's written his first unpublished manga Mars Devil uh, I don't know anything about this childhood work, apparently, that he, he seems to have in his records. Have you ever heard of Mars Devil, Darren? I've only heard the name. Even, mm. even at the Deidisha, there are no, nothing more than a few later sketches. In 1949, he gets his first published gig uh, from his records, and this is a tax payment, seemingly a public service announcement for the... Uh, Kokoro City Bulletin. Have you seen this, Darren? This I have seen, both okay. both at the Kokoro Museum itself and at the Jishar, or at least sketches thereof. The whole okay. country from 48 to 49 under the Americans going through a tax revision, the implementation of a, an odd June to June city tax, which is still current in every place I've lived, was put into place out of step with the normal tax cycle, and it was resisted for some time and because it was difficult to grasp. And Akira's little comic characters, you know, dancing down the, the pages, explaining how what to fill where and why, it certainly has that sort of cheeky style you'd expect from later work. In, in 1952, on, on Japanese shores, uh, Gone with the Wind, is introduced and this seems to be important because this uh marks a time where matsumoto is greatly inspired by uh, the main character of gone with the wind claiming uh she'll never go hungry again something to that extent and this was a sentiment in uh, occupied japan food was scarce uh there were there were financial difficulties like i said matsumoto's uh, family's class had dropped considerably. So uh, it seemed to make a, an impact on him, not just creatively, but within his own ethos, his view of his life. Certainly from an economic point of view, the family was getting by. The clan was reasonably large, but the things were not as good as you said. Mm -hmm. But more than that, there was resistance to the way in which the Americans were perceived as bleeding the country, having bombed it flat, mm -hmm. putting aside other issues associated with the war, but also the incompetence of the former imperial government, which was being blamed for leading so many young men and women to ruin, and the post-war government not being able to I don't know, wash its own hands. As a consequence, food supplies were all over the place. So the the latching on to the, the whole so-called carrot scene is not a, a reference to Beckett. It's simply that Scarlet refuses to give up in the face of the most abject misery. Now, yes. whether we can say, as, ha as the master has, uh, this becomes the the seed for Harlock's own resistance, partly. That could be debated, but it is more about his own, the master's own desire to live free and not bow to anything, no matter how severe. And we will see that will uh, pop up again in his future. Uh, in, in 1954, in February, he gets... Adventures of a Honeybee, published by uh, Manga Shonen. 
and to my knowledge, this was a prize for winning sort of a reader submission contest, testing the the skills of the fan base for Manga Shonen. And so this becomes sort of his formal introduction to the world of manga in Japan. Yes, indeed. It, it's not so much, it's not so common these days, but larger publishers would throughout the 50s and 60s, even to the 70s, run regular contributor contests to try and pick out up and coming talent. And Honeybee won as more for its visual style than its narrative style. It's of its time visually, but mm-hmm. it has a charm that still stands strong today. I can understand why it was picked. And I and I believe I also read that the Tezuka, when you know, looking at Adventures of a Honeybee and maybe some other insect-based work of, of Matsumoto from that time. Uh, that that might have been the the spark of the conversation they had, where they realized that they had both seen the spider in the tulip. Yes, I have to have say it. so. Animal, oh, what's the word? Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic animals and insects seem to be a common theme in animation coming through the thirties, forties. No matter the world you're in, mm-hmm. and there is something I don't know, un- undefinably charming about them, perhaps. But I, I had a conversation sorry to interrupt but i had a conversation online uh, we were talking about the 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 topic of furries came up and uh you know somebody somebody drew a cat girl yamato girl and people were you know discussing this and that and i and i said well uh, matsumoto maybe wasn't a furry but he might have been a buggy i mean he's got a lot of anthropomorphic bug women people in his stories it seems to be something he was rather fond of doing and maybe that was just of the time? Possibly, sir. It certainly catches, it certainly caught the cupidity of the moment in as much as through the 50s and the great craze for raising stag beetles and catching insects and, and having your own insect cage. Although that's still popular today. You can see them all over in convenience stores in the summer. But yeah, the notion... But- of insects being part of the, the overall fauna in Japan, which has so many, including some rather murder bonnets. Yeah, I can see kids who are obsessed with catching insects being taken by characters like this. Matsumoto himself was a fan. Yeah, fan of, fan of catching bugs, just like Tezuka. Um, and, and it's interesting, uh, maybe that's also tied to the food shortages after World War II, because from what I've read, uh, many families did resort to catching and eating bugs regularly just to kind of get by. And so I'm curious if if there's a connection there that it, it went from necessity to hobby in Japan's culture. And in April, he seems to get his uh, April 54, he seems to get his first steady gig with the uh, Minichi Elementary School newspaper where he publishes quite a few uh, cartoons there. Have you seen those? I've seen pages from the Mainichi back in the day. And they're, 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 as you would expect for a school newspaper, a collection of comic cuts, small school announcements, PSAs. They're not crude, though. Despite everything, they are not crude. They are a little cheeky, a little ribald, but they show real promise and quality. I wish I could see more. It's that what I find... More interesting, though, is the fact that Japan would have a, an elementary school newspaper published by one of the biggest news agents in the whole country. I think my niche at the time was the top newspaper. The fact that they would treat children with, I don't know, a sort of dignity, because a lot of the material published in the my niche elementary was not absolute kid stuff, but distilled versions of the news 1956 is 18 and he's grown up have, have we missed anything too important in his childhood darren anything you want to touch base on before we launch off to tokyo nothing that nothing that comes to mind if you've read the interview in the book he, he mentions a few things about his childhood though helen was able to tease more out and then it's as if he wanted to start with getting aboard that great JNR locomotive and mm-hmm. heading through the Kanmon tunnel. 
Yeah, it's kind of like Tetsuro, you know, as the, as we learn in the he, he takes a trip on a train and this kind of sparks it, it's sort of an inkling for uh Galaxy Express 39 and he likens being in the in the pitch blackness of you know, 1950s Japan on a train going to Tokyo and only seeing the stars. And it's seeming almost as if he was on a space vessel. This is this is a story he's told time and time again. And it always seems to change a little bit with each telling, but the core of it, I, I think, is, is still profound. As much as he understood technology, uh, his father's aircraft, his awareness of the developing state of things through the war. The fact that a country boy like him from a small provincial town would be able to take a 16 coach train pulled by something as big as a C-62 locomotive is fantastic. And let's face it, all kids love trains, especially steam trains or something. But deep in the era when this was, you know, the last of the great titans, to get aboard a train, to know that you are headed halfway up country and to realize that you're going to go under the sea long before the era of, I don't know, the channel, and to find yourself after nearly half an hour under the ocean, knowing you're under the ocean, in pitch black with lights dimmed, the sound of the, the whole process amplified to the point that it would, became a form of silence. Yeah, I can see him entering. That's the sort of Zen-like state he describes and seeing all the possibilities, having recognized that this was a journey from one world into another. Now you could debate the fact that he suggests he sees images of characters flashing before his eyes that would later come back to him. I think that's part of the whole charm. And then yeah. to burst out onto Honshu and see different fields, different sky, a different sea, and know that life was never going to be the same if he was able to live by his own, the rules he'd set for himself. And uh, it, it's interesting you say he wants to start uh, really after that and going through that, and it's almost like he wants to tell his life story the way he told Tetsuro's story, where we don't know much about Tetsuro before he goes on that train. Mm. We get a little bit leading up to it, uh, just just a preface, um, yeah. because that's what mattered. That was when the journey started to matter. And this same year, uh, Marianne of My Youth debuts in Japan, uh, starring Marianne Hold, who uh, is very often credited as uh, a primary inspiration for how he drew his female characters. And I'm, I would guess he would have seen this in, in Tokyo more accessibly, at least. Yes. After he's on the town, yeah. So this is one of his first night on the town activities once he's made it into Tokyo. The first adolescent crush, as it were. Yes. One of three women who became the sort of gestalt model for every important Regiverse woman. The other two being, of course, his grandmother from a a wonderful daguerreotype picture of her standing in black furs with a boya kappa a fur hat on. So, so that picture does exist. It's yeah. just not public. We weren't allowed to publish it. I, I've told other people about it. They say they don't. They don't know anything about it because I I'd heard it from from probably you. So uh, that that does exist. There is a photo of his grandmother, right, in yeah. black furs. Just like Maytel on a train station platform as a major I inspiration. I wouldn't say exactly like Maytel, but it's one of the pic it's one of the pictures I requested, but it's not one of the pictures we got from Lady Shut to publish. Sure. And so shortly after this, maybe this this smitten uh, his his admiration for women. Uh, you know, we have Scarlet and Gone with the Wind, and we have Marianne Hold, and and perhaps his only uh, his own matriarchs in his family. Uh, he seems to get. Steady work, most easily with shoujo manga. And he starts his career in earnest. That particular move was born out partly of the Honeybee success, as that was seen as 
almost shown a shoujo in itself. Mm -hmm. But it was also about the first job that came his way, professionally speaking, in Tokyo was with a shoujo publisher. And he worked in that for quite some time before he even thought he wanted to break out. For him, as you've seen in the book, it wasn't really a matter of shonen or shoujo. He worked in whatever method he could to, to get his message across. And he wasn't above attempting to produce comics like Tezuka, which defied labels. Now, the one that I think is most redolent of this is Mary of the Silver Valley. Started out as a fairly typical shoujo love story, but by the end of it, he converted it into adventures for lost kingdoms in the Pacific Ocean, Mu, hidden treasure. Mu. On, yeah, the lost island of Mu. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that. Are you, you know, Chad, do you know anything about Mu? I've seen the name in several places. Usually it's okay. like comparable to, uh, what's it called? Atlantis. Atlantis. Yeah. Atlantis. Okay. Is this a cultural, is this Japanese it's specifically? French, I think. French? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, authors, is it Le Plon? Henri um, Le Plon? I'm, I'm really a pleb. i sure it's just seeing it like, mentioned. But... The, the point is, though, he takes a sh he takes a shoujo, a simple shoujo story, turns it into Indiana Jones in the Pacific, and makes it appe you know, so appealing that as many boys as girls are buying the publication just for that story. It's interesting you worded. Well, he wasn't above doing shoujo, uh, but I I don't know if that was his his bro his measurement for what he was maybe above or below, or even if he categorized it, because he wasn't ever uh, afraid to turn down doing something, it seemed. No. He, had, it, he had a very strong ethos that he stuck to. I've got to take exception to that above business. There's, there's sure. not, it's not a question of being above shoujo manga. Right. Talk to Ikeda Ryoko about whether she's above doing shoujo. Well, no, 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 no. Sure, he he respected the the form no matter what. It, I, I'm sorry, I was echoing what you had said. So, oh, my apologies. <laughs> but yeah, titles, definitions—they almost seem to have meant nothing to him yes. as long as he was allowed to work in the way he saw fit. You could have called it anything. You know, you could have defined it any way you like as long as you did not interfere with his and later he and his wife's approaches to these things. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe you can at some point we're, we're going to talk about Miyako Maki soon. I, I does he meet her during this uh, briefly after his his introduction as a as a artist in the shoujo manga world? I think he I think he met her in sixty sixty, but they don't get married until sure. a few years later. Right? Yes, he they marry in sixty two. We'll we'll do that point, but um, the year before his marriage. His sister, unfortunately, passes away uh, due to a what I believe was a car accident. Um, and it, he, he seems to refer to it as a, as a death of poverty and that the implication there may be being that her accident, uh, her, her wounds were treatable, her injuries were treatable, but not with the resources that his family had at that point. And he was unable to tend to his sister before her passing, which yes. had a that, very strong impact on him. And that seems to be the case. Unable to afford the treatment that could have saved her. He was fond of his mother, but he was especially fond of his sister. And I think we can see parallels to his sister's demise and the, the void that it left in his life to the mother character in Galaxy Express 3.9, especially in Taro's interpretation of it. Do we do we see much of a shift after this in his shoujo works? Is there a shift in attitude? I mean, uh, even Tezuka had a, a bit of a blue period, so to speak. He does become more serious. Yeah. Up until up until marrying Miyako, he does a dark become, year. Yeah. Yeah. But as with all good relationships, she does lift his spirits and yes. buoys him buoys him up even to the, even to this day. A grand one. Absolutely. She has a very profound uh, impact on Matsumoto, and they are married in 1962. 
Uh, they continue to work together and their their work together. They experiment with uh, techniques and photo manipulation. You see, uh, I think around this time, perhaps exceptionally, the uh, manga images overlaying on on photo images and things of this nature where very experimental for the time. Photography is not easily accessed. I'm not sure when they started doing that, but they they did work together to push the boundaries, the I'm technical certain. boundaries. I'd even go as far as saying that in her own published work before she retired, she was the one who drove this experimental urge in both of them. Mm -hmm. Composite, you know, composite works, use of new media, and use of use of new technology. After all, it was, I believe, Miyako who brought in the cameras, even the cine projector, which became so famous a few years later mm -hmm. in the great night parties of editing. Please interrupt me when we get when we get to those years. I was going to go up to uh, 1965 next, and this is when Akira Matsumoto becomes Beiji Matsumoto, and this is sort of the definitive transformation for him. Uh, changing his what the public knows him as and, and there is meaning in that name can, can you help me with that a bit Darren? Reiji uh, Rei Zero uh, well, sorry Warrior and then G Zero Warrior Zero perhaps referring to the point at which he is starting also the idea that you measure a circle starting anywhere and ending anywhere this is the first nascent reference to Tokinoa, the whole wheel of time. Infinite was this, cycling. Was this also a term being used for soldiers? It Go is ahead. also a reference to the Mitsubishi Zerose, the the primary fighter of World War II. The Zero fighter was his favorite plane. It was what his father flew. The Zero becomes part of his name. Another quick thing, I, I was double checking, I just looking up here, and, and Google Translate gives the word Rieji uh, the meaning of illustrative. I, I'd never even looked into this. Is this, is this a, perhaps a, a reference to his work? It could be an ateji. Uh, in other words, characters with different meanings. And if it is, I think it must be a conscious choice on his part. G meaning a character. And the day, yeah, it's it's not some. It's ironic, it's not something I'd i known about before. Yeah, I, I I literally just stumbled into it myself. So we're always finding out cool and interesting things here. Just having these conversations, it's so wonderful. So he kind of just dropped a pun in his reconstruction of himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's super common in in all Japanese uh, work. I mean, th all throughout manga and anime, that is a strong, very strong, and then the. Yeah, referencing to other characters. Uh, it's something that we in English just, it goes over our head until we, we learn those languages like, like Darren has. And so the, he has this incredible uh, change. And in, then Miyako Maki, uh, in 1967, designs the Lika-chan doll. And this has a profound effect on Japan. This is their uh, Barbie equivalent as we would see it here in the West. It's something that's not as well known as it should be. Mm. People tend to think that when Maki Sensei retired, she did she did so just to become a housewife. But that's right. that's not the truth. She has worked constantly in her own way, not just as a a designer, but also as a I don't know, ghostwriter, illustrator, manager for the Ajisha. However, I she's especially fond of Dika. And her collection, as you can imagine, is the finest in the world. <laughs> I would hope so. I'd hope she have one of every type. We spoke with, uh, I spoke with Helen, and she she too brought up that the retirement, and and I was inquiring about it, and and it seems like a way that she was able to sort of remove herself from the pressures of the spotlight of as a mangaka, and sort of covertly attack her her dreams and her desires and her motivations without the the formal pressure of being a 
an active quote unquote mangaka absolutely i think i'm i contend just as helen she knew what she wanted to do and this was an, a simple and direct way of going about it what what year did she formally retire i thought it was 64 two years after the man okay wow i and and she may have also recognized to uh Leiji Matsumoto's upcoming, his sort of, uh, and, and she obviously saw it way before many other people saw uh, what he was going to become and sort of as uh, letting him become that sort of spotlight uh, person as she had been in, in shoujo. I like to think she saw his star was on the rise, but right. again, her star was on the rise. By 64, yeah. 65, her designs were... Be, her general designs were becoming more and more sought after. As a, I, I mean, her illustrative design work. Mm -hmm. And 65 was when the negotiations for what would be Adika started, even though I don't okay. think the dolls saw sale until 67. And so going to 68 in June, uh, Matsumoto takes over the Lightspeed Esper manga. And... Lightspeed Esther being a Toshiba ma mascot that was drawn, what I would say, very, very similarly to Astro Boy. And we see that Matsumoto, very adept at doing this style, he could have very easily uh, done this manga in the Tezuka style. But instead, we get something dramatically different for the time, but something that is also incredibly recognizable for the Matsumoto fan in, in modern day. And I dare say this might be uh, the first inkling or at least the, the strongest mark on, on the world of manga of what would become Matsumoto's signature sci-fi, sci-fantasy style. A am I too far off the mark there? No, I don't think you are. There is the element of not wanting to copy the work of an old friend, well, mm -hmm. a new friend. But like you say, he had to establish his particular style with the big publishers to create, to establish himself within yeah. the publishing domain. And he obviously, he had a, a will to be uh, a sci-fi creator, it seems, uh, throughout his, his life, perhaps. And just, he's sort of biding his time with, with Shoujo, happily doing it, happily expressing himself that way, but... Once he had that opportunity to do sci-fi, he knew he had to make a, a dramatic impression. And, and not ripping off Tezuka as Toshiba's original mascot designer so happily did in December is given the opportunity by Tezuka to publish in Tezuka's own publication, Com, C-O-M. And this was a very experimental magazine uh, for many artists. It did not persevere for for too long as as a publication uh, but this was a huge opportunity for Matsumoto to really strut his stuff and as 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 stalwart as he was about his ethos for storytelling he he was no longer bound by any other sort of thing other than i mean Tezuka wanted experimental no Tezuka well if you've seen his works he's co he covered everything and and maybe, you know, variety at that time wasn't, it's always been hard to publish something variety. You know, even content creators today, they'll struggle to be a variety channel and just base it off of a sort of personality for a publication that's even harder because there's no human element to grab onto. I also personally see it as being part of a, trying to find a niche. His experimentations in shoujo went one way. His experimentations in com went others, and it took him another decade or so to develop a visual and a narrative structure that would become Regiverse. And even then, he continued to experiment. I don't think we, I don't think we can accuse Matsumoto Sensei of, of getting into an early rut, because I don't think anything he did was ever good enough for him. When talking about the, the meeting well, sort of proximity to Tezuka during the screening of, sorry, my mind's going, Tulip. It occurred to them when they were sitting, working on the 
te- uh, the Astro Boy animated series in the 60s in Matsumoto's apartment using Maki Sensei's old Pathé film projector to check the daily rushes because Tezuka himself didn't own a camera. Mm. You know, half a dozen people from different productions and different production companies all working together on one of their friends' first animated products for no money, just reinforcing the idea that all this generation was coming up together and lived, died, stood or fell on the help and forbearance of each other. It was all about love of medium and love of material. Yeah, that was their that was their scene, so to speak. Uh, you know, they they click. They 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 were building. They're quite literally rebuilding Japan in very many ways. In just in their creative aspect, but that creative aspect turned into you know, as we'll see, the sci-fi works of Matsumoto, inspiring generation uh, generations of engineers, things of that nature, and and having his own impact on engineering. So in 1971. In April, he publishes the uh, a manga based on Night on the Galactic Railway, which has a very similar uh, vibe to another work, Galaxy Express 3-9. Uh, this was a famous Japanese fantasy novel that no doubt had a gigantic impact on Matsumoto. You know, I, I didn't even know about that. I mean, I knew about Miyazawa's novel, but... I had no conception Matsumoto had worked on a manga. Yes, I believe... Uh, okay, I am the dumb. <laughs> if you're dumb, I'm hopeless. <laughs> um, the very next month, he goes and publishes his first breakout hit in Shonen Magazine, Otako Oiden. And this is something that so painfully evades English audiences. Uh, this being... Uh, Slice of life manga detailing the struggles of a young Ronin student in yep. Japan and and being uh, lied to by by these tall, beautiful women who you know sort of seem to betray him uh, as he fawns over them as he sort of screws up his own life in one way or another. From what I've seen, uh, but I'm sure you've read the whole thing, Derek. Ah, oh, yes. It's not as long as people tend to think, but it is. It's wonderful to think of it being Matsumoto Sensei's first real self insert into his own work, a mm. joke on his own life, being a failure in every conventional sense of the word, as far as <laughs> yeah. 1970s Japanese society was concerned. Many but, artists finding themselves in that in that position, unable to hold a steady job or, you know, do well with women. <laughs> Ironically, years ago when I interviewed Chiba Tetsuya, that was one of the comics that came up as being almost the first thing an aspiring mangaka writes. Read Otoko Oidon and you know all the perils of being a comic artist. Or an artist in general in many yeah. cases. And so this this is a very important work for him. Makes him makes Liji Matsumoto a household name in shonen make manga, um, in contrast to Jojo. And the very next year, as we've talked about a little bit in our other video, please go check that out on uh, the making of Harlock, the legacy of Captain Harlock. We have our first appearance uh, formally of Totoro Oyama and uh, Franklin J. Harlock, I believe he's called, in Gun Frontier, in the manga series there in 1972. And this uh, hot off the heels of him doing uh, the Laramie manga as well, I believe. Another Western uh, license that he was given the ability to work on. Yes. We know for sure that in 1974, he's offered the opportunity to work on space battleship Yamato. And it's fun, funny to note, he originally declined this opportunity uh, because he was concerned about his ethos, his ability to have creative control for the storytelling, and it, it it ends up being difficult to say. W- would it have been okay if he didn't work on Yamato? Because we will find out this this does become sort of a thorn, this inability to have complete creative control over the story. But he does accept the job, 
Um, and, and that airs in November of 1974, but uh, due to very low ratings, the episodes are halved. And this seems to be a pattern of shows and animes uh, based in space that do not end up getting off the ground. Any, any words on Yamato, Darren? Sadness, really. And more for the fact that a great deal of the trouble that followed in previous decades could have been avoided if everyone, including the master himself, had been a little bit more willing to bend. It didn't end until, well, in fact, I don't think it has ended, but legally it didn't end until 2010. And it's still painful. But what, but came, what came out worked. The visual style that the sensei brought to it, the unflinching nature of the Nishizaki family, it, it created something of worth. And it is notable that in 2202, he was finally acknowledged. And in 2205, I'm not sure what he'll be credited as, but he will be on the roll. So Absolutely. the Yamato world is, is finally approaching something of a rapprochement. Even the younger generation that were not involved in the original, the artists, the designers, though they are working with Nishizaki Jr. and some of the the greats from the original, they still have to contend with the fact that the ship itself is still is still Matsumoto's design. And something I didn't note it, note here is that he was actually handed blueprints for the Yamato by a, a neighbor in his, his apartment complex. I don't know what year that was. That was oh. 50s or 60s. Yeah. And at the time, still secret and now completely priceless, which he still owns. A complete mm -hmm. architect's plan for IGN Yamato. Yeah, so complete destiny, as, as one of our comments put it there. Destiny may be the only word for it. Um, and maybe that's why he had to do this series. He, 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 he had to bend, but he didn't bend quite as much as maybe he needed to. But, but if he would have bent more, who knows uh, what, what could have happened uh, with, with other properties like Harlock being in uh, Yamato itself. Uh, he featured in the manga cut from the original series. If that had happened, I wonder if we'd even, if we would have got Harlock. Because then he yeah. would have been, then Harlock would have been tied under the yep. trademarks and copyrights associated with Yamato, and perhaps we would not have got to know each other the way we have. Mm. But but again, I you know if he wouldn't have done Yamato, I still have I'm still suspect that that he would have blossomed in his in a way still because uh, the next year he produces and publishes Emeraldus, a one shot for Princess Magazine, a shoujo uh, magazine. And this is something that I've said before, Emeraldus, at its heart, it was published later um, as Shonen. But in my mind, Emeraldus is a shoujo hero. Mm. So that was in May of 75. And then uh, the next month, uh, on the 20th of June, he publishes the first, uh, The Cockpit, Manga, and we know of the cockpit here now in America as the uh, mainly know it as the three piece OVA that was dubbed wonderfully. One of the uh, of the 20th century, I would say, the, the strongest anime work that came out uh, under the Matsumoto name. But uh, he may have all, he may have also been making uh, cockpit style manga before this, but this is the first one that's called the cockpit. Was he making that style before the cockpit came out? Not overtly, as it were. You know, socio-political drama rooted around World War II, but the style is there in a number of his works. And these yeah. are perhaps as much attempts to solidify his grasp on technology as to explore very uncomfortable questions about colonization, conquest, personal responsibility, honor. Yeah. Wonderful little tales jotted down in the fact that just like Miyazaki and Tezuka, he loved working with technology in this particular case, primarily planes. And then the next year in September, he publishes Mirazer Bon. And this is the manga that establishes his 
Tokinawa, his universe, the Liegeverse proper, and Tokinawa being the ring of time, this concept where time uh, rotates seemingly uh, on a on a path that where we see characters are able to be used over and over again, but never really in the same continuity, which causes confusion later. But once you understand the concept, it's it's quite beautiful because there is no definitive starting point in the Liege verse. This is the most frustrating part of the interview. It's impossible. It was impossible to tie him down to a particular point at which the almost I don't know, Nibelungen flow of time started to warp. Every time I'd, I, I would ask such as, did you know what you were going to do with me as a band afterwards? It was like, maybe I did. <laughs> maybe he had that ancestral knowledge that, that he didn't even know of at that point. It's he a, wasn't fully conscious of it. It's appealing to think that. By publishing Mirai Zaban first and inserting Idaiban in different places around the cosmos as different characters, such as Idaiban from Mirai Zaban is Dr. Ban from Galaxy Express. But there is no clue to it till much later. I do like that idea that having this time traveling and alternate timeline creating and manipulating almost Quantum Leap-esque comic does create the possibility to reset, rewrite, and reapproach different characters and times without having to worry about continuity because it's all legitimate under Okinawa. And I forget what uh, Tezuka's equivalent was called, the star system? The star or system. Yes. Yes. So uh, Tezuka's uh, character models being repeated and reused and you sort of see them appear, quote unquote, over and over again. And that's how Tezuka had explained it. But perhaps uh, Matsumoto's in-depth knowledge of, of science, specifically, you know, science and his love for science fiction, maybe he had an, an edge there to sort of take that concept one further. I'm not exactly sure how the star system works, but I, I know how Toki no Wa works in it. And it's quite elegant. And, and fits into reality in some ways and how we perceive time. Exactly how Tezuka saw it is, well, it's now impossible to question, but his stated position was that I don't know how to draw characters very well. So I've got a small section, I've got, a, I've got a, more, a small selection of people with defined personality types that I can plop into different roles, naming it after the Hollywood system that, locked actors into contracts with particular studios. It was a bit of a joke, but I also think it, it gave him the opportunity to create a continuity of his own based around the characters, not on the story. So when the Duke Red character is plopped into tales in different time periods, it's like an actor with a set personality type being put into a different situation and it kept kids coming back kids who found Shunsaku Ban appealing or Rock or any of the others would buy the comics for the characters as much for the stories. And in Matsumoto's case, maybe he's giving it a more mythical twist, but there's something, there's something in that. Emeraldas is more than just a gender swap Harlock, but you can't ignore the parallels completely. Tochido yeah. and Tetsuro are connected in some fashion, visually and personally, Shadow and Merto and all the Lime. other, because they are all Lamime, they are all connected at some point, even though we don't get the truth about them till much later. In in creating Mirazerbon and setting himself up in 76, he's able to explode in 77 uh, with, with all of these mythoses. He establishes in January, both Space Pirate Captain Harlock and Galaxy Express 3-9. This is monumental to have these two career-defining manga released the same year. Dare say I don't know any other mangaka who crammed it in that tight. And with a small number, only a small number of apprentices at the time. He was rattling it out. 
but he'd been preparing this for a number of years, apparently. Ever and and since, I would say ever since Yamato. I, I was gonna say I forgot uh, the the Toki no Wa in the star system sort of enabling that sort of uh, industrialized process of manga creation to limit yourself, your cast of characters and designs. You don't spend as much time worrying about what this, this one looks like or what this one looks like. You can focus on your stories. Yes, indeed. And so two months later, uh, he's able to, he works on Dangard Ace, which uh, he worked on with uh, Dan Kobayashi, premiered on Fuji TV. We don't hear much about this one in the Liegeverse, within the context of the Liegeverse. He, he really worked on the story of this primarily and the manga, I believe. Um, but, it, you know, his, this is him being almost shoehorned into mecha anime, giant robot anime, as it were. Uh, you know, I don't know his personal feelings on this, but it is seemingly speculated around that this wasn't really his bag. And maybe he was doing this to get his foot in the door to do his own anime. Now, that's one thing we didn't touch on. Mm -hmm. I've never got a, an answer from him about this. I, it's obviously not part of Legiverse. As much as I enjoyed it, and as much as it has its fans within the Matsumoto community, I think it was a question of doing a favor for a friend and a friend mm -hmm. doing a favor for him. Because without yeah. Kobayashi-sensei, he wouldn't have got the writing gig, but getting the writing gig and getting the success behind it did give him a bit of a leverage, especially when Yamato resurged at the end of the 70s and gave him, as you say, something of a pathway into doing it, doing his own series with Toy. At this point in 77, he couldn't say that he'd had a mega popular anime series under his belt. But a mere five months later, he could, as Yamato was cut up into a 130-minute uh, movie. And instant huge success. You know, it's interesting we're saying that uh, anime series, the episodic series, don't really find as much success when they're based in space. It's kind of a curse from what I understand in, in anime. Well, the Uchu it, curse. Is it Uchu? Yeah, okay. It's got a name, the Uchu curse. Uchu curse. Well, I can see why. If you're not yeah. careful and you don't have exceptional characterizations, you're recycling the same settings and right. dog fights over and over again. Yamato succeeded because there was a goal in mind and more than just a sort of villain of the week as they went. Plus, it was a relatively short series compared to some. It, it ended was, up being a short series. Yeah, well, for obvious reasons. Yamato blows up and by the end of 77... Matsumoto has a mega success under his belt. And the next year, that begins to become apparent in the world of anime, that Matsumoto is a name that will be reckoned with. Now, uh, this year, Queen Emeraldus, the manga, does get uh, published in Weekly Shonen, making that move from a shoujo one-shot to a, a sho shonen series. But again, I, I still think it's a bit of a, a shoujo hero and uh he wins an award that is for what will happen later in the year but in, in march 14th space pirate captain harlock the animated series uh is premiered and this was directed by who would become a great legend in anime himself rintaro i was going to say rintaro the most important japanese animator you've never heard of as he said himself very good at, at doing other people's work yeah, and we, we mentioned in our, our Galaxy Express 3.9 movie review that uh, he, he's good at do, telling other people's stories, and, but maybe what's part of that is that he's very flippant about what he'll take and what he'll discard from those stories to tell his own. And perhaps by putting together with Matsumoto, they, they had a, a match made in heaven because Matsumoto is not super, is not super strict about how his works are adapted. As we found out, the film continuity for, say, Galaxy Express and the TV continuity, they're both radically different, but they're both, they're both within their own time streams now. 
So much so there is, is argument as to where things like Myrtle Saga fit. Are they in the film continuity or the TV continuity? Are they in their own continuity? And so with someone like Lin Taro, he just threw the story at him and said, do what you like. And he ended yeah. up loving it because Lin Taro tightened a comic which was in places a bit bloated down to two movies, later three, which snap. And that movie will come, but uh, the next month after Space Pirate Captain Harlock releases, any, any, any notes about the reception of that animated series? As far as I can tell, it was a bit of a sleeper hit at the time. It his, got its full run, yeah, right? Yeah. It wasn't cut back. His, his fans hooked into it the first few weeks. It had the fortune of not really clashing with anything in the same mm. way as, for example, I think one of the reasons, though this is just a hypothesis, one of the reasons Yamato sunk at the, well, sunk is not the right word, but was a, was slow at the beginning is that I'm told that it was competing with Heidi, Girl of the Alps, for a time slot. I was also going to say that the Yamato sunk in Captain Harlock, the animated series, which uh, I recently posted a GIF about, and uh, <laughs> the Yamato sinks in quite a few Matsumoto animated series. I think he sneaks it into Galaxy Express, doesn't he? Or at least an Intaro sneaks, sneaks it into one of the movies. The TV series started out for the first few weeks as a sleeper hit before it, it took off. And yes, it did get its full run. It wasn't pulled back and it enjoyed more than good ratings throughout its entire run. And then the next month, he premieres Starzingers which he wrote the story for and sort of taking on what seems to be a bit of a mangaka tradition, uh, at least for the legends to retell the story of uh, journey to the West. And it's a very extremely unique retelling of it. Um, you know, you could say dragon ball is, is maybe more, but dragon ball takes it and, and just goes off the rails and becomes its own thing. Whereas star Zingers tells the story. I suppose it comes in at that period in which, Everything is up for reinterpretation. Mm -hmm. You know, late 70s, early 80s, almost like the Flash Gordon near the 30s. Put some chrome on it and throw it into space and that'll do. Yeah, the big uh, space opera boom was, was an international... The re space opera revival, so to speak, is kind of uh, taking off internationally because of the international success of Star Wars. But Star Wars, another sort of chicken and the egg thing uh, between Matsumoto and uh, if not Lucas himself, Lucas's creative team. I wouldn't um, go as far as saying Planet Mess with the Death Star, but <laughs> I know Ralph McQuarrie was aware of things like Yamato. Mm -hmm. And as much as a fan as he could have been at the time, same for, oh, who was the chap who designed the Death, uh, the, the original Star Destroyer? Not the one we see in the film, the original was some sort of space carrier and bore a strange passing resemblance to, I think it was the God Phoenix, uh, Gachaman's God Phoenix. Cross-contamination, as it were, culturally speaking, between Japan and American animation and film and model producers didn't begin in the 80s. Well, we know that, that Lucas was, was privileged enough to be able to see these things himself as well at a young age. So it's not too far removed from reality that, that he had seen it, but it's, it's, it's not documented. He is not fessed up, so to speak. Uh, so we'll have, to, we'll have to wait for him to, to make a statement on that someday. And then in September of 77, or sorry, 78, he premieres Galaxy Express 3.9 on Fuji TV as well. And this becomes the longest running Leiji Matsumoto anime series, the one that grasp audiences and has enough uh, gas in the tank to make, I can't remember off the top of my head right now, I've quite a few the, episodes. I've got the DVDs. It's a big bloody box. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's quite a few volumes in, and yes, uh, well, look at the, we've posted images of the LaserDisc collection. <laughs> that's, that's quite the mammoth. And in 79, as we were talking about, he debuts that Rintaro directed movie and really makes anime movie history with that. Uh, as we talk about in our review, please go check out that review. Uh, I've mentioned it for the last time. That's the first one I encountered. 
the first mm, Galaxy same. Express I encountered. Yep. Oh, and by the way, I've got 113 episodes for the first series, and then you've got the OAVs oh. and other things. What I liked about the film was the fact that it rattles on at a reason, it's a good pace, and cuts out much of the fat that was in the TV series when you're not having to yeah. do a sort of villain of the week or a, a moral planet point of the of week. The planet of the week. Yeah. And it plays like an opera, much like uh, some of the later films, uh, particularly Arcadia, in that some of the elements make no sense, such as, you know, the Western town on, is it Titan? No, or Gun for Titan. Titan and Gun Frontier, and then well, there's Heavy Metal. Yes, uh, well, uh, Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal. Sorry, yes. Obviously so, inspired by Heavy Metal. But. This odd blend of operatic and heroic styles that, again, pop up, resolve themselves, make no sense, but drive the story forward almost as if it was a Wagnerian opera. Pluto is, I think, my favorite. The, the, the whole field of ice. Yeah. Everyone buried in it. That's one set I'm not giving up. That that scene for me, I talked about it. And, and well, go watch the podcast episode about me whining about the Pluto scene. You can you can go comment on YouTube about how dumb I am about the Pluto scene. This is maybe the crescendo, that movie, of Matsumoto's, dare I say, entire career. Um we see the next year, 1980, Queen Melania, uh, the manga and the light, uh, light novel premiere. And then the year after, 81, a do Galaxy Express 3.9 debuts. I'm not sure what the reception was there. Still a great movie, a, a wonderful continuation. And hopefully we'll talk more in depth about that. In, in April 16th, Queen Melania, the anime premieres. And Queen Melania, the, the manga seems to do quite well. Um, but the anime doesn't seem to hook the same way as Galaxy Express had. It didn't uh, call for more than a, one season. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't designed for that. But uh, it doesn't seem like the reception was quite as hot. For myself, the only thing I, I got from speaking to Matsumoto Sensei about this was he didn't feel he got it quite right. Yeah, I almost wonder, you know, why wasn't Emeraldus the next anime? Why wasn't that the next logical step? Was there a, was there a pitch ever made? Was there a studio saying, we don't know if we can make this strong female lead work at this time? I don't know if there were other similar works at this time of strong female leads like Emeraldus on TV stations in Japan. I wish I could say one way or the other. Yeah. It it seems like maybe that was the misstep. I don't know. That that's a conversation. That's a conversation for the Emeraldus episode. We'll leave it at that. But Melania, we start to see a bit of a cooling off. And uh in 82, we we have perhaps maybe this is the crescendo actually of the career. I'm not sure, but uh in in July 28th, Arcadia of My Youth, the anime movie premieres, which does seem to have some sort of success. I don't know if it, how comparable it is to Galaxy Express 3.9, though. As a film, it pulled in middling to good returns yeah. and middling to bad reviews initially, partly because of its length and mm. partly because it was very unforgiving to new viewers. It required you to know who the characters were. And even fans, I think, will say at, at points it does drag. Yeah, the pacing is very, you know, that's something that's a word that's thrown around a lot in anime. Uh, oh, the pacing, this or that. But when yeah, was, if, if you're not in, indoctrinated in the Liege verse, it is going to be tough. When I was younger, it was tough. But even in the 90s, getting that, was it the Anime Go laser disc? I can't remember. I just saw it at a convention one day. I was like, subbed? I love that. Mm -hmm. Watching it then middle of the 90s, I realized, okay, I can see why this is paced the way it is. It's sure. an opera. It's an opera with everything except the soprano. The music fits, the pacing fits. It's a slow, but not ponderous telling, but you've got to be willing to work with it. You've got right. to be willing to 
give it its time to tell its tale. You know, somebody I was in discussion one time and somebody asked, well, I want to know more about Harlock. For, I want to introduce Harlock to somebody. How should I do it? And somebody said, well, Arc Arcadia of my youth. And I say, I, I don't think that's the way you go. I think you show them Galaxy Express 3.9 first, because I have an, a suspicion that Harlock as a character is best digested as the sort of mythical figure and not the central point of his of his stories. Hmm. Deus Ex, you know, he is a deus ex machina. Yeah. If you well, should. that's that's the lazy version in and of itself. I I don't know. I, I that's I, the that's the feeling I get throughout all the G nine 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 movies. Constant Deus Ex Machina. I tend to use Endless Orbit as a as the entry point. Okay. I, excellent as well. I will say. Not as digestible though. A movie is like oh, true, 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 true. A snack. Uh, but you're you're right. And and Endless Orbit is produced afterwards. And unfortunately, it is much like uh maybe falling victim to the Uchu curse, the mm -hmm. space curse, uh cut yep. in half. Uh not finding the success that they had hoped for. And it's and it's curious at this time that these series might have been a bit of a studio mechana uh, machination, not really, you know, sort of taking a lot of different pieces of Matsumoto's work from over the years in manga and trying to piece it together and make it work and not being a cohesive idea from the master himself. It's a good series, but it could be said it'll be a little bit hodgepodge. My interpretation is that it's an attempt to create something in the Arcadia timeline that is a, a TV series, but as approachable as it is, yes, I do think it is approachable. Perhaps it is a little bit directionless, at least to someone who already knows where they're going. Or, uh, I love and, SSX because it, it's, the, it's the gospel of Totoro. It's, <laughs> if you see Totoro as the Jesus-like figure in that, in that mythos, you know, making the ultimate sacrifice, for his friends and and then living forever but 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 again we we need to we need to go in depth on these movies in and of themselves soon and then we do get a real cooling off three years before anything really notable happens again and even that we have an interesting title uh Ares Mir Way to the Space Virgin and this debuts at a uh, the 85 Expo in Japan this this world fair in 93, we get Ultimate Time Sweeper Maharoba. Uh, that's a manga that this manga goes on intermittently for about five years. V again, very nebulous. We don't have a lot of information on it. But in 93, like I said, a very important thing. Uh, the cockpit anime, the OVA, produced by Studio Madhouse, uh, Rintaro's uh, or the person that defines Madhouse being Rintaro and the cockpit being a fantastic display of Matsumoto's knowledge of World War II, but his ability to tell a story through any means. What I think it does best is humanize soldiers, the Axis soldiers, yeah. as people, rather than what propaganda would have you believe as subhuman, um, if, if you're on the Allies' side of the world. And I think it's very insightful for anyone curious about World War II uh, who enjoys anime to watch. Um, there is no propaganda, no villainization. It is pure, beautiful storytelling and humanization of these people. And like I said, probably the peak of anime produced quality-wise uh, in all forms of Matsumoto manga in the, in the 20th century. In 98, we have a uh, Harlock Saga begins to be published, and it's actually published in a car magazine, or, uh, yeah, magazine, which is interesting, and then we get all these old-fashioned cars that Matsumoto's drawing for this, and that uh, echoes the story of uh, the Nibo Nibelheim. I, Nibelheim. I don't, Nibelheim. Maybe we're getting in. Yeah, I'm... The, the Wagner uh, piece. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pleb. Well, he, he was a, what's the word? He was a cheeky sod. When he, when he was hired on, looking at what the the Harlock saga was going to be published in, the editors like, can you stick a couple of cars in there? He was like, yeah, no problem. I love this stuff. Yeah. And actually, go back to Maharoba, if you'll forgive the indelicacy. 
warship porn. <laughs> Maha Dover is yeah. built around a number of ships and spaceships and in jokes from the Lady Verse. I mean, I think Tochido is even in there as well at some point. It, it, it's one of the reasons why it takes it five years, I think, to get all of its tanker bon out because it was essentially funded by himself, published under his own schedule. Just Matsumoto having a bit of a giggle. Yeah, kind of, you know, I think he saw the writing on the wall at that point and he was going to do what he wanted to do. He resources weren't sparse, it seems. So why not have fun with it? And looking at his his list of works going forward, it's it's clear that he doesn't really have anything left to prove except to himself. So he takes on odd projects, Harlock Saga, going beyond its its original purpose as just a an intermittent strip in a car magazine and giving us the next great step in the age of us. And in 99, the OVA quite quickly comes out. So he finds the resources to produce that to whatever uh, opinion you have of the Harlock Saga OVA. It is a bit maligned um, for its its own pacing issues. Whatever pacing issues you might find in uh, My Youth in Arcadia, they are magnified here, it seems. Ponderous. It's a good woody word. Ponderous. Very much so. Though it does have its fair share of great action scenes and extremely well animated. I would say it's the best looking thing uh, of Harlock in the 20th century. Emeraldus, I think I forgot to note the Emeraldus OVA here, which is a, is oh, a travesty. That was around that, that, was around that time, wasn't it? Was I think it that might have been 99. Can't remember at this point, but yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, Matsumoto Liegeverse OVA is coming out at this time. Uh, Maytel Legend, the OVA, is released in uh, December 12th of 2000. And there's that brief explosion, but then a couple years later, there's a bit of a deflation in uh, Leiji Matsumoto's own uh, legacy. In 2002, in March, a Tokyo court rules that Nishizaki owns the rights to space battleship Yamato, the animated series. Uh, I believe he retains the rights of the manga that he created. But this is a... I can't see this not being a bit of a deflation for Matsumoto, not just his ego, but his... how he feels about his legacy or, or perhaps even public opinion. Right or wrong, the world at the moment, at least... In anime seems to divide seems to be divided up into two camps the nishizaki fans and the matsumoto fans and there's very at least here as far as i've been able to tell there's very little distinction between the two if you ask my mate ben we were just wandering down a street in shinjuku with my g999 badges on and i is assaulted by a random nishizaki fan talking about Matsumoto's betrayal. Now, he, poor lad was obviously drunk, but a drunk man speaks the truth, whether he wants to or not. Speaks his truth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, perception. But the point is, right. this was a, a lad who clearly felt that Matsumoto's challenge to Nishizaki's ownership of what he perceived as his own series when Matsumoto was hired on as essentially help. That's one point of view. I take it's quite a bit of help. I, I take another point of view, and is that without Matsumoto, what Nishizaki would have had is the Odyssean tale or the Attic tale, and without without half the story and without any of the visual charm. Yeah, without a spaceship that isn't primarily encased in rock from Nishizaki's own uh, original designs, where it was just the. You know, we know of the, the ring of asteroids that circle the, the Yamato, but Nishizaki's designs are actually just kind of like a spaceship crammed uh, inside of an asteroid-looking thing. Now, maybe that's, Sounds maybe, that's, maybe that's practical from a... Animation standpoint, right. The animators did lament the difficulty in drawing the Yamato. I mean, well, I'm also thinking from a, a purely practical point of view, a hollowed mm -hmm. out wing... As we would see later on, uh, Tomino takes this idea 
and create Axis and the other great mobile satellites from the Gundam era. Nothing wrong with hollowing out an asteroid and making a ship in it. It's just harder to sell it as a toy. Yeah, it, it's appealing to a, a hardcore SF fan, but as you say, it's not very appealing to Bandai. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but maybe we'll have Tim on sometime to take a t take a deep Yamato dive. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, Tim knows more about Yamato than most people have forgotten. Yes, yeah, absolutely true, and uh, very important source for our page. Uh, but he bounces back faster than you could have imagined, than probably Matsumoto could have even uh, had imagined after such a crushing blow to him emotionally. The very next year, Interstellar 5555 premieres at Cannes uh, in May of May 18th of 2003. And this serendipitous, uh, his, his, his creative protégés, you know, he, he, I'm sure he created so many protégés in, in Japan, but in France, his impact there finally comes to him and says, Master, can we work on this thing? <laughs> And uh, Matsumoto just has to draw, from what I understand, he really just drew a few character designs. And uh, the animators went wild. He didn't even, he didn't even really know who Daft Punk was. I don't think anyone really knew outside, no. outside France at that point. I think around the world had, had a bit of an impact. Uh, and that was it. That was all most people knew outside of the French house scene. And so this, this really bust open a lot of opportunity for Matsumoto. And in October of that year, we have the reemergence of the Liegeverse action anime, a fresh spin on it. One of my favorites, Galaxy Railways, premieres October 4th on Fuji, BS Fuji. Huge fan of, of Galaxy Railways, another series I'd love to just look at, look at as, as a whole. Um, super fresh. Super, I, I, it seemed to have a good enough reception that they made more. <laughs> I don't know about the reception. Uh, what do you know about the reception in Japan, Darren? You were, you're closer than me. Ordinary people didn't seem to get it because it's not connected to any of the big characters. But Legiverse fans, at least the ones I know, appreciated it for the fact that it was attempting to tell stories from within an established universe but without really the big names attached to it to distract from the larger stories and as far as i can tell it all comes out of one little incident in the second galaxy express film in which i think it's is it pliades 777 a, 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 a smarter swankier streamlined train barges its way past the three nine saying get out of the way slow coach this is my route and the train salts for a few minutes, but it sets up this notion that it's not just Earth to planet metal, there is a galaxy railways. And maybe it took two decades to filter through, but when it appeared and we got all the trains laid out and all the issues that go with it and why the different routes, yeah, I don't think it suffered from the Uchu curse. It's just a, and it started out as a nice twee little jokey series that prove that it could pull. I like it. Yeah, I, I find it pretty emotionally stirring. And, and there's, there was such a great opportunity for, you know, the, uh, Maytel and Tetsuro and the conductor brought in uh, for a bit of, for a few episodes, a bit of a OVA-ish sort of jaunt. Um, I, I love it. Uh, there's so much more potential there. I would have loved to have seen more. The year after that, 2004, in March 31st, uh, a bit of a controversy comes out. Uh, Dai Yamato, I believe. Uh, Great Yamato number zero. An OVA is released over time. Mutter, 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 mutter. <laughs> Feel free to form words with that muttering there. Only uh, a few. I got nothing good to say about it. You don't have to be. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> we're here to look at the whole career. It's not. At, it's not outright bad in its own its own thing, but I can't help feeling that it's almost a pity shot across the bows of the Nishizaki group, demonstrating mm. that although Reijisha no longer could use Yamato, they still had the visual 
rights because Matsumoto did retain his illustrations and ownership of his designs for exploitation in manga and anything that could be derived directly from the manga rather than the series. And that's why Great Yamato pops up. But it doesn't go anywhere, unfortunately. A bit maligned amongst Yamato fans. I need to I need to see it for myself and make my own decisions on it at some point. I mean, I wouldn't tell him if I didn't like it, but at the same time, I can't tell it does. Him. It does have the Yamato looking a bit like uh, the Enterprise. Yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> what does Matsumoto call it? Yamato's love handles? Something like that? <laughs> yeah, something to hold on to. Um... And he was holding on to that design quite a bit uh, at that point, it seems. There's an emotional attachment. Later on that year, uh, Space Symphony Maytel, continuation of Maytel Legend, uh, one of the few proper continuations in any Lazyverse series, comes out uh, on OVA August 6th. And perhaps he shot himself a bit in the foot with Great Yamato number zero because... We don't get another Matsumoto anime, it seems, for improper for another eight years, where uh, he's able to put out Ozma, which is one of his first sci-fi romps. Hmm. I, I don't have that date. Uh, Lightning Ozma. Yes. But this anime comes out, and uh, reception apparently not hot enough to warrant uh, much from it. No, but, it's... Uh, it it's well made, but I think absolutely. I think I have to feel the character is something that not even Lagiverse fans would have much knowledge of, even in Japan. It's hard to find, or at least at the time, it was hard to find the Ozma manga outside of very dedicated early work collections. And a similar story maybe with uh, Submarine Super 99, which uh, just came out on Blu-ray courtesy of Discotech. Wonderful to have it in my possession. But uh, this was another thing that ha I think that was back in uh, 2000, early 2000s, mid 2000s, something like that. So another kind of shot in the dark to adapt the old Matsumoto works and not, not really striking a modern audience in a way that warrants a lot of it being made. The next couple years go by, and we haven't really had a, a Matsumoto anime proper since, uh, since Ozma in 2012, so we're going on a decade here. But what we do get, and there are glimmers of hope, uh, in, two, in 2014, August 14th, Captain Harlock Dimensional Voyage is published, and this is a favorite of Chad's. Chad, please, you've been waiting here so patiently. Give us a little insight. With that, it was just, it felt like it was a summary of a lot of different it, like bits of his property. And it would just like pull in a lot of strange characters that I hadn't heard of at the time. I really liked how it was less about Harlock. It was more about the family that was being built throughout the different properties. And I liked that. And we did, and uh, Warius Zero, which yeah. I didn't, I forgot to mention, is actually one of the more beloved Legiverse series. From what I can see of, of Legiverse fans, they really do enjoy Cosmo Warrior Zero. I don't remember the date that came out. Do you remember, Darren, off the top of your head? Oh, no. Yeah, well, it, it came from a video game too. And so the animation, it was a video game first, uh, and the animation is so. It's so derived from the animation that's in the video game, which is sort of, it's very stilted and lots of images moving very flatly across the screen. But the story of Cosmo Warrior Zero really strikes people. Um, it was also very bizarre. I was going to say, it must be turn of the millennium. Yeah, it's around that like two, early 2000s. I almost want to say this, this 2000 to 2005 or six for Matsumoto, at least getting the opportunity to, cr to create. Um, I know it came out on PlayStation, like the Cosmo. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, that had to have been pretty early. Yeah. As far as Dimensional Voyage goes, and this is Koichi Shimaboshi. That's yeah. right. This is Matsumoto handing over the properties in manga form, what 
I believe, for the first time. In, ta- in, in Toto, as it were, yes. I don't think anyone before that had taken charge of any of his written works before, though he'd, he'd had assistance on earlier works. Right, right. He'd always had assistance, but this is the first time somebody's taken the lead. As, as he'd given the reins to Rintaro for animation, uh, now he's giving the reins just for, for actually drawing things and bringing new life. And this is very well critically received. If I can expand on something Chad said, I too have the, the feeling that this is a family series. And I can't help thinking that it's setting up a level of continuity which will be carried on in the hopefully soon yeah. Galaxy Express manga, which is to be revived. And then who knows, who dares to dream about the possibilities of a Yamato 2199 style unified Lageverse. Yeah, but that, that's just me being silly again. Yes, and I didn't really include that on on this timeline because that, that is that is an... Inc- incredibly strong mark in the in throughout the 2010s uh yamato being revitalized under the 2199 2202 and soon to be 2205 uh which we're all kind of thirsty for over here but uh not quite leiji verse proper for legal reasons or whatever and and the real sparks we see yes with the uh, captain harlock dimensional voyage some serious potential there for uh, a strong matsumoto revival and we see this again just a couple years ago in 2019 when jerome Malkier, who we've been so happy to have on coming out with captain harlock memories of the arcadia memo uh, memoirs de la arcadia the manga or perhaps more just a comic but it's got that manga spirit. It's got the uh, Showa anime spirit to it. Uh, written, wrote, written and drawn by somebody who grew up with uh, Harlock during its heyday. The French love it. <laughs> Jerome, Jerome poured everything into that, and now we have a Blaze uh, publishing these works as well. Any any thoughts on Jerome's work, Darren? Love it. I've only seen. I've only got volume one so far. Mm-hmm. But it's a it's a creditable opening. Yeah, and this seems to mark the trend in the last uh, decade that the torch has been handed over, and that uh, much like other mangaka who have stopped producing personally, uh, their work lives on and is still able to be made into new and exciting stories. And some of these manga are talked about extremely highly in in the Matsumoto fandom. I don't know how well received, say, a new Astro Boy manga is is received in Japan. But do you do you notice it being received better or comparably to say an older manga cause with, revitalized work? With younger fans, it it's it's doing very well. And I suppose this counts for every generation. For a certain type of fan, it is the creator. For a certain other type of fan, it is the property. Mm. And since Tezuka's death, nothing has stopped any of his properties going forwards and going forwards well. Same thing with Yokoyama Mitsuteru. Same thing with, well, Lupin. But with series like Lupin and the Lagiverse, where the creators have always been open to new interpretations, it makes it a lot easier to deal with because you're not playing with a timeline. In, in fact, colloquially, when talking, this was years ago, in 2012, when I was at uh, Otomai University interviewing Chiba Tetsuya and Monkey Punch, Chiba Sensei himself called it doing, you know, like doing a monkey, at which Monkey Punch laughed because he himself had more or less, not abandoned, but after his first comic, after his second Shin Lupin, almost everything that has emerged has come out under the auspices of somebody else. And Monkey Punch loved it to see how different creators tackled his relatively one-note characters he described. So if, if you go through the list, 99.999% of all Lupin material has got 
nothing to do with Monkey Punch, but it's still it's still good. I see something of that in Matsumoto. Maybe he's only taken the hands off recently, but a lot of his work has been collaborative in one way or another, either taking ideas from his disciples as was, or from his family, or the the assistance of Maki Sensei, or from his publishers. He's not a man who's willing to stand on his own ego, despite what the courts might say. Mm. Yeah, and now, especially, what I can only see uh, as Reijisha and Shogakukan preparing the legacy. Yeah, he seems to be completely content to let other people have their own continuum within the larger stream. And it fits. Tokinoa. Yeah, definitely. The the Tokinoa, brilliant creation again and, and creates such a wonderful opportunity for it to continue on into the future. A, a, a bit of a sad note that we have here that in 2019, around the end, uh, November 19th, he did suffer from what might have been a stroke. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, it's documented, but he, he did have respiratory problems and he collapsed uh, in Italy during uh, a tour that he was doing to celebrate, uh, might have been the 40th anniversary of Harlock. Um, that seems accurate because, you know, recently there was the 42nd anniversary. So, Okay. I mean, he was giving a Harlock talk the day he did collapse. And so he has since recovered. I'm not sure to what extent, but he's publicly at least very positive about uh, the recovery and uh, working hard to regain the uh, strength that he had lost while uh, I believe he was intubated as well at that mm -hmm. point. So very difficult to to hear about this as a Matsumoto fan. It seems that his legacy... Before that, he put in the work in working with uh, Shimaboshi and Jerome Alkier to ensure that his uh, legacy, his storytelling legacy, would live on. I'm positive about the future, you know, hearing things about maybe we will get that 2199-esque retelling, a proper retelling of Harlock or Galaxy Express 3.9, something like that in the future. If there's a demand, I'm sure Shogakukan and the others will. I have a demand for it. <laughs> What's your... Yeah, we're demanding it. We raise our hand. We're demanders. Yeah. He has bounced back. And until he officially decides to hang up his hat completely, I think he will be part of our lives. Maybe he'll get that brain in a robot body someday. Oh, <laughs> we'd love to see it. I um, think he would, considering what he thought of Planet Mantle. See, I had heard that he was interested in the idea. Maybe I heard wrong. It's always possible. I, I, maybe I'm delusional. Maybe I dreamed it too. So no, you, may, you may be right. I've never talked to him about transhumanism. Well, I'm, I'm just going on the way he describes the soullessness of the mm. the mechanical bodies but yeah. then again he has mechanical he has mecha humans in positive lights as well i believe it was helen who kind of put that seed in my brain maybe i morphed it into something else that he wants his own his his own living forever type of future and and i believe we we said something along the lines of well if he never finishes the story he'll have to live forever to keep telling it Something along those lines. A bit cheeky. But let's hope that uh, the stories continue to come for a long time. And this has been the life and times of Luigi Matsumoto to this point. And I'm looking forward to the story moving forward. Again, I'm Captain Hardluck. Check out Facebook.com slash Liegeverse. We're posting nearly daily at this point. I started to take Sundays off, so... Give me a break. Uh, but we're, we're trying to bring you that content. Something new, something fresh to look at almost every single day. Uh, Chad, you want to tell the people about what you do? On this page, I primarily just make a lot of memes. Uh, you know. Um, Captain Harlock yeah. and the Arcadia. Yep. Yeah. Um, aside from that, I also 
am a co-host for a Moon Knight podcast going on, let's see, 218 episodes. Definitely more than Galaxy Express 3.9. Yeah, Into the Night, correct? Yep, Into the Night. Uh, Spelled with a K, because Moon Knight. Yes, yes. Moon Knight. Excellent. And and Darren, what are you up to? What you, what have you done? I want to I, remind the audience. I do as little as possible. <laughs> good. All right. Good enough. <laughs> go go buy Leiji uh, Leiji Matsumoto essays on the manga and anime legend. And uh, as you did tease a bit, there may be more coming of the, in the same vein at I some s- point. I sincerely hope so. So make sure you get the one that's out now. So you're fully abreast for possible part two. Come on, don't oversell it. <laughs> That's all I do. I sell, baby, sell. Buy Leisure Masamoto things. Go to Amazon. Go to where? Go on eBay. That's it. That's all we got for you today. This has been the Free Arcadia Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Goram. Goram. <laughs>